Today, I'm going to talk to you about insects. You might well end up thinking that I'm quite eccentric, but I love insects. I have done all my life. I don't know why. Um, I, some of my earliest memories uh, are, are of insects. When I was about five years old, I collected uh, caterpillars from the edge of the, some weeds on the edge of the school playground. And I put them in my lunchbox and took them home and then reared them up in my bedroom. I fed them leaves and they turned into these beautiful red and black moths. And I was hooked. And I've been really lucky. I've managed to spend my whole life, um, I, I've managed to make a career out of studying insects, which, which is nice to be able to take a childhood hobby and spend your whole life doing it. What a privilege. This up here is, is my youngest son, Seth, bless him with his pet cockchafer. Uh, his name's Colin. Um, he loves insects too. He, he, like me, he catches them and he keeps them in his bedroom. He does occasionally forget to feed them with unfortunate consequences, but, <laughs> but he loves them, uh, just as I did. And I hope he never grows out of it, just as I didn't. Um, but the reality is, sadly, that most people do. Um, many people, when they're kids, they're fascinated by nature, but as they grow up, they, they lose that. And most teenagers and most adults, in my experience, if anything buzzes near them, their first reaction is to swat it and try and kill it, which is really sad, um, because insects are important. Uh, and I'd like to try and persuade you all here today to, to love insects, or if maybe that's a bit ambitious, but at least to respect them for the things that they do for us. But before I tell you more about insects, I want to talk about something a little bigger, um, this, this is our beautiful planet. This is, this is where we live. This is everything we have, basically. It provides us with food and water and, and, uh, and air to breathe. Uh, and it's populated. It's a miraculous thing. It's populated by maybe 10 million species of, other, of animals and plants, as well as ourselves. There is no planet B, and it... I find it astonishing and bizarre that we're being so reckless with the health of our planet. Um, we're doing all sorts of things which are damaging the environment. We're changing the climate in a, in a way that might well become a runaway process that's irreversible within a few decades from now. We're polluting the air, uh, the rivers, the soils, the seas with plastics and heavy metals and pesticides and fertilizers and all sorts of other chemicals. We're still chopping down the rainforests, even though we know it's a really dumb thing to be doing. We're over-harvesting the fish and so on and so on. You know these things, but we don't seem to be doing much about them. All of this is driving a biodiversity crisis. We are losing species from our planet faster than has happened for 65 million years since the dinosaurs were wiped out by a meteor. Um, about a thousand times the natural historical rate of extinctions, which means that Probably while I'm talking to you, a species somewhere is going to go extinct. Now, most interest in conservation, most money and most people's perception of conservation is that it's about big, cuddly animals, things like tigers and pandas and polar bears and so on. Uh, that's where most of the, the attention goes in trying to prevent those creatures from going extinct. And I think in focusing on those, we've missed the bigger picture and we've missed perhaps the most profound change that's been going on in our environment, which is the quiet disappearance of the insects. This is something that's been going on for a long time, but we've only very recently begun to appreciate it. So let me show you something that ought to terrify you. This looks like a pretty boring slide I've put up, but what the information it contains are really concerning. So, I could talk to you, but there are many different lines of evidence for um, insect declines, but this is perhaps the most dramatic one. And these data are from Germany. Uh, German insect enthusiasts, entomologists, um, have been running malaise traps in Germany, all over Germany, on nature reserves for the last 30 or so years. A malaise trap is that funny-looking thing, top right, which is, it kind of looks like a half put up tent, but it's a trap for insects, catches flying insects. And the, the chart shows you the, the daily catch per trap, the weight of insects caught per day per trap, and how it's changed from 1989 to 2014. And 
it fell by 76% over that 26-year period. Three quarters of the insects seem to have disappeared. And that's really, really worrying, because insects are vitally important to all of us. Um, the insects make up themselves the majority of biodiversity on the planet. About 60% of all the species we've named are different types of insect. But also, they perform all sorts of important ecological roles without which uh, ecosystems uh, couldn't function. So, for example, they're food for an awful lot of other creatures. Many species of bird eat insects, as do amphibians like frogs and bats and lots of lizards and so on. So they would all disappear if they didn't have their food. Insects do other things, too. Probably the best known is they pollinate. So 87% of all the plant species on the planet need pollinating by some kind of animal. Not necessarily an insect, but almost invariably it is an insect uh, of one type or another. You probably immediately, when I say pollination, would be thinking of bees. Uh, there's a lovely bee top left. But lots of other insects pollinate as well, moths, butterflies, different species of fly, and so on. And between them, they're delivering a, a vitally important service, not just to wild plants, but also to, to us, to our crops. So three quarters of the crop varieties that humans grow in the world um, depend upon insect pollination. So if we didn't have insects, then we would lose the, a large majority of the tasty food that we eat and rely on. This shows you a supermarket, and we've become accustomed to our supermarkets being stocked with all sorts of lovely produce from all over the world that's flown in. Um, if you took away the insect pollinators, this is what our supermarkets would look like. Um, we wouldn't have strawberries or raspberries or tomatoes, or chili peppers, or pumpkins, or courgettes. I could go on and on and on. We wouldn't have coffee, and we wouldn't have chocolate. Life would hardly be worth living, would it? Can you imagine? Um, and, and seriously, we couldn't feed everybody. The seven billion of us and counting. If, if three quarters of the crops that we grow in the world weren't pollinated, then simply people would starve. So, E.O. Wilson is a, a famous, very old American biologist, actually an ant specialist. Um, and he put it pretty nicely. I won't, I won't recite the whole thing, but he basically said that if mankind were to disappear somehow, the, the planet would do just fine without us. It would actually regenerate wonderfully and become a green and pleasant place, rich in biodiversity once more. Um, but if the insects were to disappear, the environment would collapse into chaos. So the evidence that insects seem to be disappearing should be really concerning to all of us. What are the causes of insect declines? Well, it's kind of complicated. There are a number, but I'm going to talk briefly about perhaps two of the biggest ones. Um, one is habitat loss. So um, around the world, we're still destroying natural insect-rich, uh, wildlife-rich habitats of all sorts, including the rainforests. Closer to home, in Europe, uh, we used to have vast areas of flower-rich grasslands grown for, as, for hay, for livestock. Um, this picture is of one from Scotland, absolutely beautiful, and you can see why that would be teeming with insect life. Not just insects, but all sorts of wildlife thrives there. Um, as I say, we used to have lots of this. Just in the UK, a hundred years ago, we had about uh, three million hectares of this kind of habitat. But in the 20th century, we got rid of 98% of it in the UK, virtually all of it. Slovakia has got off more lightly. You still have quite a bit of this left, and you should hang on to it because it's a precious habitat. And if you replace it with stuff like this, which is what most of it's gone to in, in the United Kingdom and much of Western Europe, then not surprisingly, the insects have disappeared. In fact, pretty much everything has disappeared. Now, of course, we need to feed people, and there's, there's a real debate to be had about how do we do that. We've got a human population of seven and a bit billion going to grow to 10 billion, 11 billion, maybe 12 billion by 2050. That's a lot of mouths to feed. And most of us accept that we need industrial farming to do that. I would argue with that, but that's a talk for a, another day. But it's certainly true that if we choose to grow crops in these huge monocultures like this, then we're eradicating wildlife, all kinds of biodiversity from the landscape. We're creating a landscape which has almost zero biodiversity, just the crop. And that's having huge impacts on, on the planet. Now, associated with this form of um, 
uh, of food production is the heavy use of pesticides. This farmer's spraying pesticides, as you can see. And we use a bewildering number of pesticides these days. In Europe, about 500 different pesticides are licensed for use by farmers. Um, and in the UK alone, we apply about 16.9 thousand tonnes of pesticide to the landscape every year. So I'm just going to give you one example. This is one field. Uh, sorry, this looks a bit complicated, but it's a, it's a chart of the chemical applications to a single crop in its growing season from when it was sown in August 2012 to when it was harvested in June 2013. And this just one crop, and it's a very average crop, not being treated differently to every other field, received 20 different pesticides, a mix of insecticides and fungicides and herbicides and molluscicides. Little wonder, really, that there isn't much wildlife to be found in our farmland these days. It's not just farmers that use pesticides. You can go to your local garden centre or DIY shop or even supermarkets these days sell a whole range of different pesticides for people to use. I'll come back to that later. Um, and even if you don't use any pesticides in your garden, maybe you've already got onto the idea of looking after insects in your garden and you're planting flowers to encourage bees and butterflies and things. Um, unfortunately, you may well find that you're accidentally poisoning the wildlife in your garden because we recently, a lot of garden centres in the UK will badge the, the plants that are attractive to bees and butterflies with logos like these, this bee-friendly one or perfect for pollinators, which identify the plants that the insects are really attracted to that you might want to buy to put in your garden to feed the bees. 75% of these plants, uh, based on work we recently did in my uh, lab, 75% of them contain insecticides in the nectar. So to keep them looking beautiful, they're sprayed with all sorts of insecticides before you buy them, which means that you're taking them home and accidentally poisoning the insects in your garden. So if we put all that together, we shouldn't really be surprised if insects can't cope with their habitat being destroyed, they can't find any food. When they do find food, it's probably poisoned with a whole bunch of pesticides. It's all rather sad, isn't it? Um, sorry, this is a bit of a depressing talk, but it, it, I'll, I'll stop depressing you and try to cheer you up now, because the good news is there's lots we can do about this. We can fix it. It's not too late. Most insects haven't gone extinct. Many conservation stories are really doom and gloom. You know, what do we do about the polar bears or the rainforest? We feel helpless as individuals. Anything you might do seems completely inconsequential. But with insects, because they live all around us, they live in our parks and gardens and so on, we can all do things that will directly help them and which will visibly, you'll be able to see the benefits. The main thing I'm going to talk to you today for the last few minutes is how we can make our gardens and our urban areas into uh, a kind of network of insect nature reserves if we just slightly change the way we manage them. I've written a whole book about this, which comes out in six days' time, which I'm quite excited about, but I'm just going to give you a few highlights today. So firstly, a couple of things I'd ask you not to do, or not to do very much. Firstly, don't use the pesticides. You just don't need them in a garden. Maybe farmers need them to grow food, but absolutely you don't. I have a big garden full of fruit and vegetables and flowers, and I don't use any pesticides, and it's just fine. Occasionally, I get some aphids on my roses, I just leave them, and usually a hoverfly or a ladybird comes and eats them pretty quickly. And if they don't, the worst thing that happens is I've still got some aphids on my roses. Big deal. Um, surely that's better than spraying poisons in my garden where my kids play and my pets play. The second thing you can do is just not mow so much. Humans are somewhat obsessed with mowing. We, a lot of people aspire to a kind of Wimbledon tennis court style lawn with stripes up and down it, and they mow it every weekend, which is kind of nuts. Why do we do that? If you stop mowing it just for a couple of weeks, then most lawns will burst into flower. There are plants there that would love to flower, they just don't get the chance because we're endlessly mowing. So next time you get the urge to mow, Restrain yourself, make yourself a cup of coffee or a gin and tonic and sit down and look at the lawn and watch the happy bees flying about. It's much more calming and it saves petrol. Another thing you can do is grow the right kinds of plants. So you might think that all flowers are good for insects. And of course all flowers evolved to attract insects originally. But Many of them have been intensively bred by plant breeders to produce things that they thought would be attractive to humans. 
And this here is a classic example of that. These are both roses. I don't know which you find the most attractive, but the one on the right is close to a wild type rose, and insects are really attracted to that. It has lots of pollen. Those orange bits are the anthers producing pollen that the bees collect, and there's nectar in the bottom that they also love to collect. The one on the left, the kind of classic rose that you might be delighted to receive on Valentine's Day, is a mutant. It's a mutant in which the anthers that produce the pollen are, have mutated into extra sets of petals. So it's basically just a bundle of petals. It's, a, it's completely useless to insects. It's an abomination, if you like. So you might think it's pretty, but next time you're buying a rose, buy one like the one on the right, and the insects will thank you. More broadly, there are lots of plants that are pretty much useless for insects. Many of them are annuals that are sold outside garden centers and DIY shops in the spring, often in disposable plastic pots, often grown in peat-based composts, almost invariably sprayed with lots of chemicals. There is nothing green about these plants at all. They're hideous. Get rid of them. I don't know why the gnome is there. It's a personal thing, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and instead, grow these kind of plants, beautiful, we often call them in the UK cottage garden plants, old-fashioned varieties. They tend to be perennials. Um, there's loads to choose from. Um, if, you, if you want more information about that, I've put a bunch of YouTube videos which will guide you through the bee-friendly plants in my garden. So have a look at that. Um, another thing you could do, if you just remember one thing from my talk today, it's this. You can get rid of all the weeds in your garden in the blink of an eye if you just reimagine them as wildflowers, because that's all they are. Um, a weed is just a, a figment of our imagination, if you like. So this dandelion is beautiful, and insects like to visit it. So why do we spend so much time trying to get rid of them? Seems kind of crazy. A final thing you could do is make or buy a bee hotel. So the flowers provide insects with food, but they also, many of them, need somewhere to live, a home. And um, Many species of bee like to nest in little holes. You might think bees live in a hive, but that's the honeybee. That's just one species, the domesticated bee. Actually, the majority of bee species are solitary. They live on their own. And many of those solitary bees, they like to nest in horizontal holes, uh, which you can easily create with a drill and a block of wood or bits of bamboo cane. And if you do, and you hang it up in the garden, ideally on a south-facing wall or fence, You'll get things like the red mason bee, top right there, coming out in the spring. And at this time of year, you'll get leafcutter bees living in there. There's the leafcutter bee, bottom right. With, with homemade ones, you can't see what's going on. So bottom left there, that's, that's a simple design with holes in a block of wood. You can see that that hotel is full. Every one of those hotels has been filled up by the bee. But you can't see what's happening behind those are mud plugs they put in the end. But you can buy these really cool commercial designs of bee hotels that have windows on the sides. Uh, and you can open it up, and on the right there, you can see what it looks like inside, um, the little piles of bright yellow pollen with developing bee grubs on them. Really cool. My children absolutely love to peek in and see how the bees are doing. So, if everybody put up a bee hotel and had some bee-friendly flowers and stopped using pesticides, we could make our gardens, our villages, our towns, our cities into a giant network of insect nature reserves, which would be fantastic. It really worries me that Seth is going to end up, when he's my age, living in a world that's depleted of most of its natural resources and which has lost most of its natural wonders. I find it really bizarre that seemingly most people would do anything for their children apart from leave them a decent planet to live on. We have to do better than that, and we can do better than that, and maybe one of the things we can start by doing is all getting involved in looking after the insects in our garden. Thank you very much for listening.